Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars. You know, on a... I can't complain. It's actually not that bad right now. It's not as horribly humid as it has been. I don't know if today is just a special day. Maybe it's the beginning of season weather that's sort of on the way. Maybe we'll have milder weather. I doubt it. I have a feeling, well look, it's it's unquestionable, but that by noon it's going to be sweltering. And uh, you know, whether or not the mornings are nice from here on out, we'll see. Uh, there's birds chirping all around me. They sound pissed off and weird. Um, a little bit angry. Hopefully they don't come down and try to peck my eyes out, but you never know. Uh, definitely more bird activity here in Peter's yard than there has been lately. And. Um, and let's just get into this. And look, before I dive into this car and make apologies for it, let me give you a quick update. Obviously, it's been a while since I put a video out that wasn't entirely intentional. Uh, you know, I took that little trip to North Carolina I, to a cabin to get some peace and quiet. It became a little more extended than I thought it would. I, you know, turned off the phone. Uh, I, I just, you know, being up in the mountains there was the greatest escape from what's been going on here through the summer. It was like 57 degrees at night, uh, even at noon when the sun was out. It was just absolutely lovely, and I just didn't want to come back. And uh, so I shut everything off, I turned everything out, and uh, and I hung out there for a little while. I went then to Savannah to another uh, auction and ended up with a few cars that I had no intention of buying, but I did. And, um, and so here I am. And I'm basically dealership less. I have left Auto House, as I mentioned before. You know, just uh, the place changed hands again. They're very nice new people who own it now. Much nicer than the last guy, frankly. And uh, and I wish them very well. But it was just one too many sales. There's only so many times you could be sold like a piece of lawn furniture before you just give up on it. So uh, that's what I did. And I found solace in the coronavirus whiskey. You know, thank God for the coronavirus because it does give me a nice excuse to have plenty of whiskey in the mornings and uh, keep things going. Uh, but anyway, look, that said, uh, uh, me and a friend, uh, Al, he bought some buildings in another part of town. He's had a dream of starting a little car dealership for a while, uh, so we're going to put something together over there, but it's going to take a while. Uh, the RV trip coming soon. Uh, my lady friend who, you know, frankly despises me, she actually watched one of these videos recently where I mentioned her and she had all sorts of questions about it. You know, if I don't mention you, it means I don't love you. So, uh, but she didn't quite accept that. Uh, that said, she's doing some kind of a trip in a couple weeks. When she comes back from that, my plan is to go up to St. Augustine uh, as a uh, initial test run for the RV and, uh, you know, see how that goes. So if that happens, which I really hope to God it does, uh, then that's going to be uh, videoed. I might even set up some GoPros in the wagon or the wagon, the RV to, you know, capture what's going on. So uh, we'll, we'll see. But I do have some cool cars coming up uh, for normal general reviews, not including this one, uh, which we'll get into a minute. I've got a very cool 76 Ford wagon. Uh, Uncle Johnny has a Bonneville that's coming up. I think Auto House has a Grand Wagoneer that they're going to loan to me to do, and uh, we should have some fun stuff on the horizon. And uh, all that said, I'm going to leap and jump directly into this car. And I'm doing this car for a couple of reasons, so don't be too hard on me. Uh, yes, it is a 2022 Tesla Model 3 performance, and after doing that Model Y, I think I might have promised that I was not going to have to do another Tesla, and here I am doing one. Uh, but, you know, there's a couple things I didn't get into in that video. Uh, you know, I got into the features of that car more than my feelings about electric cars at large, and that's more of what I'm going to do here. Number two, this is Andrew's car, and I love doing Andrew's cars. First of all, because I love Andrew. Like a brother. I mean, uh, you know, I've known him for, God, 10, 15 years now. Uh, we've always, I mean, he treats me terribly. He's a horrible, horrible human being, uh, but I still can't help but love him. He's just a fascinating guy. Uh, there's this terrific story of him uh, paying the detailer to 
put a half-eaten hot dog up his rear end so he could take a picture of just the end of the hot dog coming out uh, that he then showed to people who he was offering hot dogs to. But it's a story that's probably not, you know, worth getting into at the moment. Instead, we're just going to jump into this. And again, 2022 Tesla Model 3 Performance. Uh, they were first released in 2017, the Model 3, and it was... Uh, Tesla's entry, entry, foray, entry into the more affordable car market, although I find the prices to be absolutely ludicrous, uh, no pun intended, but, um, you know, it's, it's now the most popular EV in the U.S. and globally. It's on track to sell more than 200,000 units in 2022, which is astounding to me. Uh, these are numbers I wouldn't have thought possible five years ago. I wouldn't even have considered it. It seems like such a niche thing. Uh, but apparently people are lapping these things up for whatever reason. Uh, and there are three variants. There's the standard Model 3, which is called the Range Plus. Uh, there's the long range, and then this one, the uh, performance model. Uh, the entry level one, the standard range plus, it has a single rear motor uh, and rear wheel drive, while the other two have dual motors, which, you know, makes a difference in terms of performance and, for some reason, range, although it's shit that I don't understand. Uh, it's basically classified as a luxury compact sedan. Um, it competes with the what is that? Yeah, the, yeah, the, okay, it competes with the BMW i4, something called the Polestar 2, which I have no idea what the hell that is. I read it in a car and driver article. I've never seen or heard of one before that. And uh, the cheaper Chevy Bolt, that I do know. Uh, the Volt, of course, has an engine. The Bolt doesn't, which, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I'm sure Chevy could explain it. And the revolting Ford Mustang Mach-E, which to me is just an absolute bastardization of the Mustang and mach -E. Not that I'm any great Ford Mustang fan, but give me a friggin' break. An electric SUV, and you call it the Mustang Mach. I mean, somebody should be shot over that. And Lee Iacocca would... Ugh. Anyway. Um... It's the price leader in the Tesla lineup, this thing. It's the cheapest one. You know, it's the one that uh, the entry-level guys can afford, even though I find it to be ridiculously expensive. Uh, the models Y, X, and S all cost more, uh, some of them particularly more. And, uh, you know, if you're sort of getting your feet wet in the electric thing, don't have a ton of money, then this one might be right for you, the Model 3. And look, by all accounts, it's a good car. You know, I I read about 50 reviews on it. I drove it myself, obviously, but I wanted to see what the car mags thought of it. And uh, they all seemed to like it, to, and to a certain extent, even the ones that are truthful about performance cars. The fit and finish, which I've always crabbed on Teslas about, you know, I mean, their body lines have historically been horrible. Uh, their fit and finish has been bad, but they've gotten better at it. And uh, it's good. It's not up to BMW or even Ford standards, but it's acceptable. Uh, the design, you know, this is another, this is going to be the kind of theme of this thing. Okay, so the design is very distinctly Tesla. I mean, when you see it going down the road, if you have even a modicum of interest in electric cars and Teslas, you're going to know this is a Tesla. Uh, it, but it could be a Hyundai when you look at it. It's a weird little balance that Tesla pulled off, being able to make a car that essentially looks like a Hyundai be identifiable as a Tesla, and I give them a little bit of credit for that. Uh, the driving dynamics are pretty good, especially for a car that weighs pretty close to 4,000 pounds, because of course batteries and all that shit are very heavy, and uh, as I said, I think it's pretty expensive, especially in this upmarket trim, which, uh, you know, Andrew couldn't help himself. He's just not the entry-level kind of guy. Uh, but to me, what Elon Musk has done here is sort of... He's made the iPhone into a car. I mean, it's this uber geek level technology. I mean, stuff that just would put most, you know, honestly, when I was in high school, the guy talking about the stats on this Tesla would have been, you know, beaten to a pulp or at least, you know, hung in a locker room by his jock strap or something. It's just, you know, th these are not people who were pretty cool. <laughs> 
I was a kid. But anyway, Elon has taken that and he's made it mainstream. He's made it uh, accessible and usable by just about anyone. And that was really the trick of this. Uh, he's made it an image car that's desirable. And, um, you know, that's why I think it's working pretty well for Tesla. And they, even with all that, here's the issue with it. It just doesn't have a soul. I mean, he recently claimed that gasoline cars are soon going to go the way the steam engine, that, you know, the dodo bird. It's yesterday's news. We're all going to look at gasoline cars as some ancient contraption with wonder and merriment that we see in museums. And that may well be true. I hope it isn't, but it may be true. You know, again, this world that we're coming into definitely isn't the one for me, uh, especially since I started reading Twitter. Jesus Christ, especially since I started reading Twitter. But but, um, you know, he has managed to make this more mainstream. Uh, but I don't think the Model 3 is going to be the car that makes the steam engine out of a gasoline car. Because it just doesn't have a soul. Not at all. Not even close. Uh, it just doesn't get your blood pumping. It's insanely fast. It is. I can't argue that. It does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a glorified golf cart. And I don't say that in the way that people say it in an offhanded way. You know, oh, it's electric, it's a golf cart. I mean, to me, when I drive this car down the road, when I hammer it, when I steer it, it really does feel like just a golf cart that I have on the road. Uh, there's just nothing in it that gets my blood pumping. And uh, I think that's an absolute shame. And then the question comes, does it really help the environment? And that's something that I want to get into with these electric cars, you know, because, oh, my God, oh, it's an, oh, you're a wonderful person. Look at you driving an electric car. I think a lot of that is absolute horseshit. If the source of energy that's being used to charge these cars is not friggin' windmills in Sweden, uh, then it's probably coming from a coal plant, you know. Even a nuclear plant would be better. But uh, you go into the Midwest, you go into Pennsylvania, Michigan, that, a lot of the, uh, the energy for these cars is coming from coal. That means that the emissions that you think you're saving by driving around have already been pumped out in some distant power plant before it even got to your car. And in places like that, a gasoline hybrid car like a Prius, um, if it's your sort of thing, is absolutely more beneficial to the environment than a full electric car. And, uh, you know, this is just the kind of crap you don't hear in the news very much because, of course, I think the forces of the media are sort of aligned behind electric cars and behind, you know, the sort of pseudo upper middle class douchey mentality that, you know, uh, oh, you don't have to worry about inflation because we just passed a bill that makes electric cars more affordable. Well, I mean, the, the fuck, how the fuck does that help anyone who, you know, be, works hard for a living, you know, cleaning cars? It just doesn't. And I think that's one of the disconnects between the elites and the common people in America. And I think as a result, electric cars don't get the uh, examination in the press that they should. Um, so look, so uh, yeah, again, if your car if your energy is coming from a coal plant, you're not really helping anything. You know, you might as well drive an F-150. It just really doesn't make that much of a difference. And you also have to, excuse me, consider the mining of the batteries. Uh, you know, you're talking about all these rare earth elements. Mining them is a filthy process. Uh, it pollutes, you know, third world communities. You've got children doing slave labor, digging up cobalt by hand, basically, and becoming polluted. And, you know, all of that kind of gets a little bit of a pass uh, in a way that I don't think is entirely fair. So most of the cobalt in the world comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can imagine how well that's all regulated. Uh, and you've got a bunch of kids out there, child soldiers, digging it with their bare hands. I mean, you know, how the hell can you drive your Tesla to Whole Foods and feel good about that? Uh, lithium, it's mined in Australia, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, uh, operations that use a tremendous amount of groundwater, like 50% more water usage than it takes to build a standard gasoline car. And of course, water is one of the key, you know, 
elements of our ecological future. They say that fresh water is going to be one of the, you know, tough things to get to everybody in the world. And uh, these things take a ton of it to come into existence. So, um, you know, between the rare earths, all the stuff that comes from China, from Congo, from Bolivia, uh, these cars have a very troubling uh, ecological footprint. It may not come up to the level of a gasoline car in terms of, you know, when you do your math by the UN science department, okay, fine, this is 50% better than an F-150, but it's still not what you think it is. And when you're driving one of these things, uh, you know, to your little gathering, and to me, it's just basically a car that's made to make upper middle class wine moms feel good and, you know, virtue signal to their friends and, you know, to the deplorables like us. And, uh, you know, that's great and they love it and they're zero emissions, but they really aren't. And I don't think the press does its job in pointing that out. And I think that's, um, in the current parlance, I think that's a little bit problematic. And uh, it's something you just don't hear about enough. It's an awkward topic for the press that, you know, electric cars do have an unpleasant ecological footprint. Uh, and, you know, the... the <laughs> One thing Tesla has managed to do is take it away from just them. I mean, with the Prius, you basically knew you were dealing with 90% douchebags. With the Tesla, you're going to get some people who are impressed with the technology, uh, you know, who have decided that it's a cool way. You know, old guys buy it to feel current and relevant. Um, Gen Zers, you know, wealthy Gen Zers, wealthy millennials, they buy them because it's become the new aspirational car instead of the Mercedes and that's all fine and good but uh, I still don't think it's you know entirely fair uh, you know to present this car as some sort of earth-saving machine because that it just is not uh, so kudos to Elon Musk for you know making the car appeal to metrosexuals and wine moms and old guys and enough to sell 200,000 units but you know I think if he didn't have a lot of help from government subsidies and a lot of help from the press and uh, a lot of help from the you know wealthy elite types on Twitter I don't think he'd be doing anything close to that and now that he says he's sort of a closet Republican we'll see if it keeps going <laughs> I have a feeling it might not uh, but uh, anyway look we, okay and then there's this then there's the ordering process which Andrew described to me uh, he basically bought this thing the way you might buy a toaster oven on Amazon Prime he goes he downloads a Tesla app he picks out the car he wants he picks out the color he wants. Uh, he hits order. He does all the financing paperwork and uh, buying paperwork on the phone. Never talks to a human being of any kind. Uh, he makes the down payment with Apple Pay. Uh, everything gets done. They say, okay, your car is going to show up in X amount of days. It showed up early. He gets a text message saying, your car's ready. Come to the Tesla dealership locally and pick it up, which he does. He gets a lift down there. The car's sitting in a parking space. It has some barcode you scan on the window. He scans it. Nobody around, nobody to talk to, nobody there. Uh, fills out a couple more forms, hops in the car, unlocks it, and drives away within 10 minutes. And it would have been a lot less if he knew how to adjust the mirrors. If he'd watched my Tesla Water Model Y video, he would have. And, you know, okay, great. So you've got this hip, new you know, personless, soulless method of delivery where you don't have to talk to a human being. Uh, but how many people are out of a job over that? You have no sales guy, you have no, you know, delivery aid, you have nobody helping you set up the phone, everything's with online tutorials. Um, you know, what it does is it makes you feel hip and current, but at the same time, it's like getting a robotic worker at McDonald's to shoot your Big Mac down a chute. You know, it's just putting people out of work. And you could say, great, that's the future. There are no farriers anymore. There's nobody putting horseshoes on. Except when things go wrong, and this is something they talk about on Tesla forums, you don't have anyone. You don't have a sales guy that you can call. You don't have a finance manager that you can call. You're starting from scratch, basically as if you're trying to get customer service from Comcast. And, uh, you know, so everything works great when everything works great. But the minute there's a problem, my understanding is that it becomes a lot tougher to deal with. Uh, he basically bought 
financed and delivered this car without a single human being being a part of it. And uh, the car was fine, everything went well, great, he took it, he loved it. But if one thing was off, it would have been a little bit of a nightmare for him to reach a human being and make it happen. So, uh, yeah, you get a fully personless, uh, personless delivery, but um, uh, I don't know if it's the future that we all want. It's a good car for agoraphobes, I'll say that. Uh, you know, at least they're going to be able to buy something without talking to anyone. And despite feeling kind of modern and sexy, I think losing that personal touch is just an other aspect of the car having absolutely no soul at all. So um, there it is. So look, I'm going to pause for a minute, get my shit together, and then we're going to dive directly into this car. So hold on one moment. All right, so let's just dive right into this thing. We're going to start with the exterior, which is perfectly Tesla, and by that I mean is it's absolutely distinctly a Tesla, which has very often been my complaint with other cars, that they all look alike. I mean, Teslas, you can almost tell, are Teslas, and somehow they pull that off despite the thing looking like a Hyundai, and, uh, you know, I wish I understood how. Why? Well, I guess part of that is, okay, so it's got, the, here's the Tesla style, and you'll find it across their model lineup. Uh, you've got this low, swoopy body. There's lots of curves in it. You've got a very angled down nose, so you've got a pretty commanding view from the driver's seat uh, because the nose tapers off down. You've got a place where it looks like there should be a grill but isn't, and I would like it if there was, even a fake one. You'd think they could find some reason to induct air into the car uh, in the middle of that front bumper, which just looks unfinished to me. Uh, you've got these kind of swanky looking headlights that every car has now. Uh, this being a performance model, you can see it's got these big 20 20-inch rims with, uh, you know, red calipers and big brakes. I believe they're Brembo's, and, you know, that's all great and, you know, what it should have. Uh, you've got a tall greenhouse, you know, lots of glass, lots of visibility, um, you know, all very interesting shit, to be honest. Uh, here's the thing that just absolutely confounds me is it's got this big sloped back. It looks like it's a hatchback, but it isn't. And by not being a hatchback, it loses functionality. I do not understand why they didn't just make this thing a hatch. I mean, I'm not a fan of the Model Y either, but, you know, at least when you pop up the back, it's got a hatch and gives you more cargo room and accessibility. This one does not. Uh, you've got all the, you know, fancy-looking LED tail. It's LED lighting everywhere because, of course, not only is LED the thing, it's also good for electric cars because they don't use a lot of juice. Uh, if I had the charger going and I went near this little light extension here and press the button this whole panel yeah, you can't do it without that would pop up and uh, that's where the uh, charger port goes um, you know again you've got the traditional swoopy whatevers you've got cameras everywhere you've got cameras up here in the uh, the B pillars you've got cameras here in the fenders uh, they didn't do any kind of real fancy pop-out door latches for these you just you know give it a pull and it's all kind of semi-manual <clears throat> but let's have a look inside the trunk which is power. Oh, yeah, and of course, because this is an Andrew car, there's going to be guns. There's always guns in an Andrew car. So let's see what we got here. <laughs> he got a... Uh a very vintage style AR, I have to say. That's sort of Vietnam era M16 looking with the uh, carry handle on the top and, you know, the stock in the back that's uh, sort of fixed with probably a toolkit in there. Uh, I think the foregrip should be a little smoother for Vietnam era, but um, boy, that's a long one too. That's got to be like a 20 inch barrel. Um, but yeah, I like that. Okay, that's a pretty cool one. I don't know, again, why he keeps, you know, military style weapons in the trunk of his car, but God bless him. This is cool. This is interesting to see. Okay, so we have an FNPS 90. Um, it's a really toy gun, kind of expensive, not terrifically ergonomic. Uh, one of these things you see in science fiction movies a lot because it's very modern. It's got this weird top clip. Uh, the whole This one's a 30 rounder. I know you could have a 10 rounder as well. Um, and uh, a very strange way of holding it. Uh, you know, this is a cool little range toy I have to say. And I can appreciate it being in here. Definitely could use some optics. But uh, God bless Andrew for 
keeping guns in the car. I love them for that. All right, so here's a Tesla charger. I actually used that last night. Uh, and this one, I had the 110 plug, which is absolutely fairly useless. It takes like two days to charge. He installed, had an electrician come out and put some level two charger at his house, which will do it fine just overnight. And uh, of course, then there's that whole Tesla supercharge network where, you know, you can charge the whole car in like 30, 40 minutes, whatever the hell it is. But you know, 30 minutes while other people are fueling up and driving off and uh, yeah they give you pac-man in the dashboard to entertain yourself uh, but at the same time you know people who put gas in their cars are driving away and if you're getting your fuel from a coal plant then it's just not really worth it is it if your thing is saving the earth so anyway there's the trunk and i tell you what well, let me do, I'll do the mechanicals real quick. So to close that, you give that a press. I see we've got carbon fiber spoilers and shit. I imagine that's part of the performance package. Uh, if I get into the mechanicals on this thing, I'll do it up to the point that it really bores me. Uh, this one being the top of the line three, uh, it's a dual motor unit. Um, it's got a motor in the front, motor in the back. It's all-wheel drive. It's got the equivalent of about 480 horsepower, which is insane, about 470 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, the standard cars work with a 54-kilowatt-hour uh, battery, but one of these upmarket ones goes into, um, I want to say it's like 82 or something kilowatt-hours. So you get a bit more juice, you get a bit more range. Uh, the uh, long-range model puts you up in the, you know, the higher threes, and this performance model, I think, has you in the mid threes in terms of miles of range. So uh, if you, you know, want to leave range anxiety behind, don't opt for the standard model, which is under 300. Uh, go for one of these things. Uh, you've also got a very traditional four-wheel independent suspension. Pretty sure it uses wishbones front and back, basically, coilovers. You know, you've got your sort of traditional disc brakes. It also, of course, has the reject generative braking, you know, which um, takes some getting used to. But as far as being a car, sans the electric motor, it's a pretty normal car. Uh, the battery is on the floor of the car and it weighs a shitload. So the car weighs a lot. Uh, you know, a Hyundai with a gas motor in the same dimensions is probably a little over 3,000 pounds. This thing's pretty close to 4,000 pounds. Being a low center of gravity, that helps it handle well, but it's still got a tremendous amount of bulk so you take it out on a racetrack you know yeah it has pretty good turn in it has pretty good cornering but you've also got so much heft going into a corner if you come in too fast there's just no way around understeer you know the car is going to push itself forward on the front because it's just heavy it's the antithesis of what uh, Colin Chapman talked about with handling you know a guy who ran that little company called Lotus they knew a little something about handling and uh he was all about making cars light and that is you know the one big drawback to an electric car uh, in terms of making them performance oriented in terms never mind that yeah we'll get into the sound thing but as far as just making them nimble it's very hard to do because the cars are heavy they can make them handle pretty well they can make them steer good they respond good great but they don't handle the way that a light car does and never will secondary to that you know everyone talks about the incredible speed these cars have and yeah it's true this thing with its dual motors and what zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds we're talking like porsche 911 turbo territory it's insanely fast andrew took me on a drive yesterday and and honestly, just scared the crap out of me because I'm old and I don't drive that way anymore. But he does. And yeah, the car was fast. It was also silent, which was friggin' weird. But it's cheating. It's not like they had to engineer these cars to go fast. Electric motors are either on or off in their purest sense. So you connect a cheap electric motor to a battery, you turn the power source on, and it's at full speed, full torque almost right away. That means by its very 
definition an electric car is going to be fast because if anything they have to manage the the way that it gets up to speed that it's not just full throttle the minute it's getting full electric so yeah okay it's fast but it's not like they went through some great engineering process to make it that way it's just the nature of the beast so you know if you take that away if you take it away as some achievement in engineering um, what do you have you know you have a car that's too heavy to handle great uh, with with a really fast so, I mean if you put a 500 horsepower motor in a Kia Elantra you'd have a better handling better driving car with the same performance and uh, I think that's something that needs to be stated about that so anyway look I'm gonna get my shit in the trunk and then we're gonna hop in and go for a drive so bear with me one moment all right so let's have a look at the inside so again with these sort of semi fancy door handles which you know don't pop out the way they do on an S but still look kind of you know forward thinking yeah whatever it's great uh, it's a very very simplistic interior in this car I mean we are talking no frills at all the fit and finish has improved tremendously there's no doubt about that uh, but um, you know the materials yeah they're fine the trim is fine but it's boring. You could fit three Canadians back there. Uh, the center one isn't going to be too unhappy because you got a flat floor. There's no drive shaft. Uh, but you're going to be a little bit tight. And, um, you know, whatever it is, it is. Also, because of the sloping roof, first of all, if you're in a, a climate like we have here in Naples in July, this is going to, like, be under a magnifying glass. God help you if you have a bald spot. You're going to end up with third degree burns. And uh, if Andrew's driving and your head's up against that uh, that C or D pillar back there, you're going to hit the side of that thing pretty hard, I can attest. Uh, the door latches, little button here just to release. You've got another window switch, but switches are at an absolute minimum in this car. I can't close it uh, because that's just the way Tesla seems to want it. So let's have a look inside. The front, you know, I mean, there's Danish modern minimalists looking at this thing going, okay, you know, you've taken it too far. I mean, look at that. You've got nothing in front of the steering wheel, not a gauge, not a light, nothing, absolutely nothing. Everything is off that 15 inch screen in the middle. And frankly, you know, it's great for your Gen Zers and Millennials and old guys who want to feel hip. Uh, but for me, give me a friggin' needle gauge in front of me. It's what I need to feel like I'm driving a car. Uh, the only buttons and switches here, you've got our windows and the door opening. You do have a traditional, you know, seat switch power stuff down there on the bottom of the seat. And a couple of stalks on the steering column and a couple of roller knobs, but that's it. Got the climate going crazy here, so let's do this. Turn that down. Where's our temperature setting? On high, manual. I don't want to be on high. Where the, where the hell is the temperature? This is the kind of thing that drives me crazy. I just want to set the temperature to cold. Oh, okay, here we go. Manual 66. 64, that's good. The split. Uh, here we go. So that's up on high. You know, and again, it takes ages to learn all of this crap. It took Andrew, who's a very intuitive guy, 10 minutes to adjust his mirror. I mean, that tells you something. Uh, here you can open your frunk or your trunk. Uh, you click this, you get into all the... Look, if you want to see the controls, I went over them extensively in that Model Y video, and I'll link to that, you know, where you can turn your horn into a farting thing, and uh, you can do a PA system to uh, address the crowd, and, you know, all kinds of goofy stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get into that here. The only thing I will get into here, and let's see if I can find it, we're going to climb it. Uh, because it's the one thing that I absolutely can approve of Tesla for. Let's go to manual. Here we go. AC. Can't, uh, child mode. You see, if for some reason they're calling it dog, but let's, you know, call it what it is. So you hit that, and what that is going to do is absolutely brilliant. Because let's say for a minute, let me turn that fan down. Oh, for the love of God. What the hell is climate now? 
And now you can't, okay, so dog mode is keeping it on a certain temperature. And we turn that up, so maybe that's what's going on there. Yeah, there it is. So anyway, so let's say you have a child in the car. You want to go get an Asian massage. It's really awkward to bring a child into the Asian massage place with you. So this way, you can stuff them in the back. You can, bam, hit child mode. Uh, it'll keep the AC on. It'll keep the child safe. Uh, when it starts running out of battery, it'll text you and say, hey, you're running out of battery. You may want to come get your child out and, you know, then you can do that. So kudos to Tesla for that. I think it's smart. I'm not sure if there's any, you know, security features that keep the doors locked. Hopefully there is. That would be smart. Uh, but at least you could almost call it the Asian massage mode. But uh, anyway, there it is. It's all fantastic shit. Uh, you get into this toy box. Oh, that's the color. Here's the toy box. Okay, you know, this is great. You can play the bat of a friggin' Pomatopia or Sudoku or Sky Force or Fallout Shelter. Or, uh, somewhere on here is Asteroids. All of this is meant to distract you while you're charging your car and you're watching other people just gas theirs up in six minutes and drive away. That's it. That's why that's there. And, uh, you know, great, fine, fun, but uh, find a way to charge the cars faster if you really want electric cars to do what they're supposed to do. And, uh, you know, from what I hear, they're going to make trucks be electric soon. Let's see if they can really get, you know, a shipment of oranges from California to Michigan efficiently in cloudy weather, you know and in a way that makes sense. But anyway, if you want to see all the electronic crap on this car, um, then click on that Model Y video. I get into it. If I got into it here, we'd have a 90-minute video, which is just too long. So instead of that, let's just take this car for a drive. My seatbelt on. Uh, my phone is officially the key. Uh, Andrew sent me an invite, so that's how that works. Uh, he also ordered some sort of a key from Tesla. Here it is. Uh, this was like 150 bucks, and you had to program it to your car. But I will say this. If it was a Mercedes key you ordered, it would be 150 bucks, and then 400 to program it at the dealership. So, you know, Tesla's personless shit is also kind of, you know, useful in some ways. Apparently up here, these are dual charging ports for your phone. Uh, doesn't work on mine because of whatever case I have, but apparently Andrew's charges when he puts it here. One thing that's annoying is the phone's kind of looking at you, giving you messages as you're driving along. And, uh, you know, you just feel inclined to check them out while you're hopefully not going to crash. Uh, he has the window sticker here. Uh, which to me was shocking. Again, 64 grand. There's a lot of cars you could get for that kind of money that just feel a lot more substantial than this one. Uh, but there was just one price. There's no decorating. It is what it is. There you go, 113 miles per gallon. Annual fuel cost 600. But it doesn't get into the differences between where you're getting your power from. Uh, when he went to pick up the car, this was on the window. It congratulated him. It showed him how to get his car, complete his document and not ever have to talk to a human being so god it's a whole new world and i'm not fit for it a couple more years i'll be in north carolina and some kind of a prevost big rifles all right let's see if we can go why can't i get this stupid thing to go there it goes so we have this giant nav screen and again look at this nothing in front of me and if you watch the night video at the front of this video it's just black it's just all black in front of the steering wheel which feels weird and strange and i don't like looking towards the center of the car to see the speedometer bird all right go for a drive and again no noise obviously you know i wonder why it has all these ludicrous you can have farts you can have all kinds of there's the woman in the strange hat with her dog hello there um you can have all kinds of weird sounds from the car why not a big black chevy mode you know why can't you press a button and have the sound of 502 cubic inches at least being piped through the speakers like they are in a modern bmw with some little shitty turbo motor uh you know that's still gives you the audio experience I get no man I need the audio yeah okay that's insanely fast I mean I'm going 70 miles an hour in two seconds with the press of the gas 
and yet somehow it manages to be boring. And once you do it two, three, four, five, six times, it's still boring. <laughs> that is kind of fun. But anyway, um, yeah, it's just not for me. And you do get road noise because even, you know, without the scream of the engine, you're hearing the suspension work. You're hearing the tires on the pavement. Um, you know, it is basically a commuter car. It just, I mean, I would have four times, maybe 40 times the amount of fun in a C4 Corvette with a handshaker, an old turd like that. And there's the police, so we can't really get too crazy. But um, I would have so much more fun in that car that's like one quarter the price, you know, if it had a handshaker in it. I mean, this doesn't even have a shifter knob. <laughs> I can't do anything. All I can do is steer and press the gas and occasionally put it in park, which you don't even have to do. It'll just park itself when you walk away. So, you know, this is a car for people who just don't care about cars. They don't care about driving. They don't care about, you know, the, the thrill of the engine, the thrill of the sound, the feel, the rubber grip. You know, you make it a performance model, great, it's fast, it's wow, it's amazing. But at the same time, it's just a way to get to work and back in the same way you'd feel in, you know, that whatever the hell it is or the other whatever the hell it is in front of me. It just is not what it should be. So, um, look, anyway, I'm not going to ramble on and on about it. Again, if you want to see the features of a Tesla and uh, delve into this big screen and, you know, what it has and, you know, I will, I do like the resolution. I mean, I wish my iPod looked like that when I used it at home, but in the car, yeah, 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 doesn't do it for me. Um, Look at the Model Y video. That'll give you a lot more. Uh, otherwise, thanks to Andrew for letting me do a photo of this uh, video review. He's doing a tour on it, so if you want to rent this car, you can. I don't know how the hell you'd find Andrew on the website, but you can find him and rent this thing. And uh, somehow he thinks people aren't going to beat the living shit out of it uh, when they rent it, but I suspect they will. Uh, but we'll see. And uh, otherwise, I should have some fun stuff coming up. Like I said, I have a 76 Ford wagon, probably a Bonneville next week. And if things go well, I'll have a Grand Wagoneer before the weekend is here. So thank you for having a look. I'm sorry I've been away so long. I'm going to try and get back into it. We'll try and get the motor home going. Try to do all the things we've said we're going to do and uh, keep moving forward. So take care and we will see you with the next one.